Blessed be the one holy and ever-living God. Glory, Glory to, to God, God forever, forever and ever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. God of all mercy, we confess, we confess that, that we have, have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. We have, we have denied, denied your goodness in each other, in, in ourselves, and in, and the, in the world you have created. We repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior Jesus Christ, that we may abide in your love and serve only your will. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. God be with you and also with you let us pray almighty and everlasting God you are always more ready to hear than we to pray and to give more than we either desire or deserve pour upon us the abundance of your mercy forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask except through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ our Savior who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Let's say Psalm 19 in unison. The heavens, heavens declare, declare your glory, O God, and, and the firmament shows your handiwork. One day tells its tale to another, and one night imparts knowledge to another. Although they have no words or language, and their voices are not heard, their sound has gone out into all the lands, and their message to the ends of the world. In the deep you have set a pavilion for the sun. It comes forth like a bridegroom out of his chamber. It rejoices like a champion to run its course. It goes forth from the uttermost edge of the heavens and runs about to the end of it again. Nothing is hidden from its burning heat. Your law, O Lord, is perfect and revives the soul. Your testimony is sure and gives wisdom to the innocent. Your statutes are just and rejoice the heart. Your commandment is clear and gives light to the eyes. The fear of you is clean and endures forever. Your judgments are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, more than much fine gold. Sweeter far than honey, than honey in the comb. By them also is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern unwitting sins? Cleanse me from my secret faults. Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. 
Let them not get dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound and innocent of all offense. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O God, my strength and my redeemer. This is a godly play story from the book of Exodus. This is the desert. The desert is a dangerous place. People do not go into the desert unless they need to. There's no water in the desert, nothing to drink. There's no food in the desert. There's nothing to eat. When the wind blows, the sand moves and things change. And sometimes people who are in the desert get covered with sand. When you're in the desert, you wear lots of clothes because during the day, the sun comes down and it's scorching hot. And you keep your clothes on to keep the sun from burning your skin. And at night, you wear lots of clothes to keep you warm because the desert is very cold at night. The desert is a dangerous place. People don't go into the desert or cross the desert unless they have to. The people of God came to the desert by crossing the river. It was a hard, long walk. And there wasn't much to drink except what they had brought with them. And the people of God became thirsty. And some of them complained a lot and said, maybe we should go back to Egypt. But they kept moving forward. And they followed their leader, who was Moses. The children stayed with the grown-ups. And people helped the older people so that they would be safe in the desert. When they finally came to a spot outside on the edge of the desert, they were very happy. And Miriam, who was Moses' sister, led the people in song and in dance. They praised God and thanked God for getting them across the desert. While well, they had more walking to do, they had a goal. They were going to go to Mount Sinai. And Moses asked the people to follow him. And they did. Again, it was a hard walk. And there was a lot of complaining. But the people were thankful. And they knew that God was keeping an eye out for them. Moses went ahead, and the other people followed. And when they came to Mount Sinai, they didn't go too close, because there was smoke from the top of Mount Sinai, and there was fire, and some of them were afraid. Moses climbed up to Mount Sinai. And when he got about halfway up, the people below couldn't see him anymore because he was covered in smoke. And God came so close to Moses, and Moses was close to God, that God shared with him the best ways to live. God sent Moses back down the, the mountain to the people. And Moses showed them the tablets that he brought that he'd written those 10 best ways on the things that God had told him. The most important thing to remember was to love God 
and to love people all around you, people all over the earth. And also to remember that God loves you. And there were very important, ten very important things on these tablets. The first one is don't serve other gods. And make no idols to worship. And be serious when you say my name. And keep the Sabbath day holy. And then there were some other things. Honor your mother and father. Don't kill. Don't break your marriage. Don't steal. Don't lie. And don't even want what other people have. Now I know that these are all hard. God did not say that the 10 best ways to live would be easy. He said that they were the 10 best ways to live. Sometimes we call them the 10 commandments and that they're hard. And some of them might even be impossible, but we're supposed to try. They mark the best way like stones in a path. Now I wonder, which one of these 10 ways that you like best? I wonder which one of these 10 ways you think is the most important to you. I wonder if there's one that's especially for you. And I wonder if there's one that we can leave out and still have all that we need. I wonder which part of the whole story you liked the best. I wonder which part of the story was most important to you. I wonder which part of the story is about you. I wonder if there's any part of the story we can leave out and still have all the story that we need from God. The Word of God. Thanks be to God. A reading from Philippians. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, 
forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of Christ, of God in Christ Jesus. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Jesus said, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants, who will give him the produce at harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. And it's amazing in your eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruit of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard these parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. Peace be with you. I'm going to begin with a short quote from the prophecy of Isaiah. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. My beloved knew what he was doing. He cleared the hill and planted the vines and tilled them and harvested the grapes that were the reward for all of that hard work, except they were not good. They were wild grapes, sour, bitter, just plain not good. I wonder if that's how some of us might be feeling these days, like we've worked and worked and all we get is wild, sour grapes. I mean, take the people who wear St. James on the parkway. St. James was planted in the East Nokomis neighborhood in the early 20th century. It moved to the parkway in 1940 when their beautiful new perfectly Anglican church was built. And for 80 years, the congregation were served by many talented and caring priests, not the least of whom was so highly regarded that he was called the Pope of the Parkway. 
The vineyard was planted and it was tilled, it was maintained, it was nourished. The people cared for the vineyard by worshiping and cleaning and mowing and cooking and teaching, encouraging, disagreeing, crying together, laughing together, learning, and so much more. But after all of this, after all of the planting and tilling and after all the care, the ultimate harvest seemed to be sour. The building was too much. The vineyard was too unmanageable. And the Holy Spirit led the people to another vineyard. This other vineyard, St. Luke's Episcopal Church, had also been lovingly planted and tilled, and the harvest continued to be rich. But rich harvests can be challenging too. This harvest is rich in challenging ways, not overflowing vats of the best wine, but nevertheless enough. In fact, plenty. Plenty of the best wine possible from this vineyard in this season. Our parable from Matthew's Gospel is almost nobody's favorite. It's violent and it's depressing and it leaves us afraid of what might be next. Like the beloved vineyard owner in the prophecy of Isaiah, this vineyard owner seems to be a good person, but this is a good person who is punished by the assaults of life, evil tenants, violence, loss, anger, and death. As is so often the case with Matthew's Gospel, it's tempting to look away from the ugliness of the stories he tells. It's tempting to deny our discomfort with the stories he tells and to think of pleasant things. But it's much better, it's much more helpful, it's much more holy to instead look directly at the story, to look it in the eye, Look the story in the eye and admit how it makes me feel. Like there is nothing here that will get us off the anxious hook, the unholy fear of tomorrow, the nasty taste of life's bitterness in our mouth. Now, look at what Matthew is doing. He's working in the best way he knows how to build a Christian community that has a clear identity, that is, able to live in a nasty, bitter world and to overcome it. Matthew draws us into his process of telling and retelling the story of God's people. That means he builds a history that is so strong that we still read it today. He chooses sacred texts for us. He establishes rituals that help us gather together to build a faith community. And maybe most important today, he reminds us that we need to be people whose actions are for the good of all, in the name of Jesus. Not just ethical people, ethical people are great, but ethical people who follow Jesus who suffered at the hand of evil tenants and whose vineyards sometimes grew sour grapes. Matthew uses Holy Scriptures in new ways to build his listeners into a new sort of community, a new people. And he also identifies enemies. I mean, common enemies unite us, you know. And, and because he builds communities by doing this, by uniting people against common enemies, down through the ages, he has also incited violence, horrific acts of Christians against Jews, Muslims, others, because of Matthew. Huge scars on history. So what do we do with a founding story that seems to have lost its function as intended, and in fact, today can cause harm? 
What do we who are building a new community of faith do with the stories that sometimes embarrass us by teaching, at least to contemporary ears, the wrong things? Look at the United States, speaking of wrong things. The idea that Americans have, Americans have a manifest destiny, a holy charter, clear direction from God, has led to the extermination of indigenous peoples, the theft of their land, the theft of their livelihoods. It's led to religious persecution of anyone who is not white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, or who doesn't speak English, or who has skin that is not pale white. And one of the reasons our society has been this way is that we have stories that unite us against common enemies. So we see enemies instead of possible friends wherever we go. It's us against them instead of us and them. All of this leaves us in a horrible position. We are two congregations that are becoming one, day by day, step by step, and we can choose to believe that we have to do this because of the losses and exigencies of life. We're pressed into this corner. The stories that created and sustain our community are too often deadly, and we live in a toxic environment in every way. Climate, politics, disease, and the racism inherent in all white people. What do we do? We're building a new community in this sick environment. What can we do? You and I need to face the ugliness of some of our biblical stories, some of our founding stories, our identifying stories, and reinterpret them. We are what we have heard over and over in so many ways, from so many directions, for so many months. We are at an inflection point in history. The stories, the myths, the legends that shape us and help us build our stories, our story. All of these things are truly ours, and we need to accept them and even welcome them. Because today, they give us the impetus to do a new work, to reform, to move beyond who we are created to be, to move beyond rallying around common enemies, to reform, to form ourselves into an ever reforming community of saints, people who are baptized, and because we are baptized, to seek peace and to seek the good of all, every one, every thing. In his address to the Convention of the Episcopal Church in Minnesota last week, Bishop Craig Loya drew a roadmap for us. He told us how to think about doing this, this reforming. In everything, in all that we do, in all that we say, in all that we pray, it's about discipleship. It's about doing small things, I mean, large things too, of course, but they're rare and hard to do. To do even the smallest things, the everyday things, with great love, in the name of Jesus. As tenants, we're to go out into the vineyard that is the world and to do everything we do with great love. Not to keep the sweet produce of our vine stories for ourselves, but to carry it out by the baskets full and to give it away. Not to beat the owner's representatives, 
but to recognize that our story begs us to understand that we are the branches of Jesus, he is the vine, and that our tendrils are meant to embrace the entire world with the sweet scent of hope and fullness of life. As he gives us today's parable, Jesus is on his way to the cross. He draws us into the depth of his story so that it will become our story. He draws us to the cross over and over again and reminds us that while his hands bear the wounds of the death that pierced him, they are also held up in honor to God, the Almighty and Holy One. They are also signs of his life. And they are our promise of eternal life. Now, along with St. Paul, along with followers of the Christ throughout time and space, we pray that we might know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by reforming ourselves to be like him in his death and rising with him in life.
Let us join together in confessing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe, believe in God, God the, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the, On the third day, He rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, let us pray. Our, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Holy One, in whom we live and move and have our being, you call us to be your hands and feet, your heart and voice in the world. Through your grace at work in us, may justice roll down like a river and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Help us bring healing to our broken world. Blessed Creator, you love the world you have made. Guide us to find and embrace effective measures to halt the spread of COVID-19. Help us to care for the hardest hit communities. Protect all who work to keep us safe. Merciful God, our hope is in you. Redeeming God, guide us as we elect our leaders. May they act with wisdom, promote the dignity of every human being and serve the common good. Benevolent God, our trust is in you. Inspiring God, Bless our clergy as they follow Jesus in the way of love. We remember Michael, our presiding bishop, Craig, our bishop, Larry, William, and Morris, our clergy, the lay readers of Saints Luke and James, and all who minister to you in the church without walls. Loving God, our trust is in you. Reconciling God, open our eyes to see the effects of racism in all its forms. Heal our blind spots. Heal the harm racism has done to your people. Give us insight and courage to dismantle racism and build up the beloved community. Compassionate God, our hope is in you. Saving God, bring comfort and healing to all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. We pray for Barbara, Bill, Carl, Charlie, Charlotte, Colleen, Cortland, Dan, Daniel S., David S., the DeVore family, Frank, Fred, Gail, Ginny, Harper, Jean, John, Kathy B., Kathy, Kurt, Kurt H, Liz, Margaret and Jerry, Marcella, Marlis, Marsha, Molly, Nancy, Rick, Riley, Ryan, Sarah S, Shawana, Theo, 
Tommy and Steve, Sumatra, and Virginia. Please add your own names. Merciful God, our hope is in you. Bless our dear ones who have gone before us, that your will for them may be fulfilled as they continue their life in you. We remember Henry Owen and Marguerite Berry. Please add the names of those who you are remembering. Bring comfort and healing to all those who are grieving. Merciful God, our trust is in you. Empowering God, help us put on our spiritual personal protective equipment to do the work you have given us to do. The helmet of salvation to shield our souls. The breastplate, the breastplate of righteousness to protect the spirit breathing in us. The shield of faith to quench the fiery darts of fear the belt of truth to banish confusion, and the shoes of the gospel of peace to bring comfort and healing. Gracious God, our hope is in you. We love you. Resurrecting God, we open our hearts to the work of your Holy Spirit. Cleanse us, renew us, and remake us into the image of your chosen one. Jesus Christ, may he increase as we decrease. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of our Savior Jesus Christ and the blessing of God Almighty, Creator, Redeemer, and Sanctifier be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be always with you. And also with you. Peace, peace of the Lord. Lord. Good morning and welcome to online worship with the Episcopal community of Saints Luke and James in Minneapolis. We are so glad you could be with us today and hope you will return often. Each Sunday, we have a gathering time on Zoom at 9.30, one half hour before the 10 o'clock YouTube service. After the dismissal, 
we invite you to click on the link below the YouTube video and join us for virtual coffee. An adult forum completes our morning, offering a robust series of presentations and discussions. Now let us go forth into the world, rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia.